My name is David Bird. I'm a fellow of the ILD and one of the coordinators of Australia's Melbourne chapter. I'm joined by Nathaniel Washington, the coordinator for the USA Pacific Northwest chapter. Today, we're excited to welcome you to the seventh interview in this series with <coughs> Faye Greenhash from Melbourne and CJ Bookwave from Seattle. I would like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations people with a traditional welcome to country. We acknowledge that this meeting in part is being held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and future. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors. The Designer by Designer series is made possible through the general support of our sponsors, Platinum Level, Axis Lighting, Cooper Lighting, Luton Electronics and Lumen Pulse, and our gold level sponsor, Lambert Lighting Group, plus our civil silver level. It is now my pleasure to introduce Faye Greenhouse and CJ Bokway for the seventh interview in the series, Designer by Designer. Hi, thank you, David, for um, passing that on. Thanks for Nathaniel and the team for organizing. Um, hi, CJ, good evening. Hi, Faye. Good uh, afternoon. <laughs> Good morning. What time is it there? Just after 4 p.m. Okay, cool. It is 9 a.m. here in Melbourne, Australia. Okay, so we'll get started. I'm just going to ask you a few questions, but it's nothing. You know, you carry on and we'll see where it goes between us. Um, so just a few quick fire questions. So my internet does keep trying to cut out. So let me know if anything happens. <clears throat> um, so just a, few, a bit quick fire, go a bit more into your design ethos and a little bit more about you and your practice. Um, so we'll get started. So teamwork or solo? Teamwork. Great. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. Definitely better to have more people and thoughts and ideas on board. Um, white light or colored light? Yes. <laughs> Bit of both. <laughs> Depends. What's Perfect. Light? Yeah. What, light or shadow? Uh, uh, definitely both. Definitely both. Yeah. Um, outdoors or indoors? Uh, I'm inclined to say outdoors, but on a day like today, and I think the same might be true for, for Melbourne right now, is uh, I'm glad to be indoors. <laughs> it's going to be outside. So in terms of lighting, do you like, do you do prefer exterior applications or interior, or are you a fan of either? Um, you know, we actually have been doing quite a bit of both. Uh, during the pandemic, it was fantastic to be able to do mm -hmm. outdoor projects. Um, uh, it kept us busy. So yeah, I, I like both. Yeah, great excuse to actually get out when you're yeah. in lockdown. Um, new or heritage or older? So in terms of projects, would you prefer, um, if we're doing a building, a residential, would you prefer something older, a little bit more heritage, or would you prefer a new build or mm -hmm. a bit of both? Um, I often don't have the luxury of, of anything very old because I am working in the States. Um, yes. But I, I do have to say that uh, it is pretty fascinating to work on projects that are landmarked or projects that have some historical context or relevance to them because I do know that we have to make decisions that are needing to be fitting with um, wherever the projects stemmed from. So um, uh, preference, it's hard to say. Yeah. Okay, bit of both for that one. So going back to that, can you tell me a little bit about, um, are you actually from Seattle? Have you always worked in Seattle? Where's your journey into lighting stemmed from? And yeah. it, you know, a little bit, and then maybe we'll go into a little bit of your practice actually based there. Sure. Um, well, I am actually a third generation from Seattle. So, and I appreciate the reference to the first peoples because we have those, in, we have a lot of, um, uh, um, people who've been in the Pacific Northwest for 10,000s of, <laughs> of years, so uh, many, uh, much respect to, to them as well. Um, I actually think that my small three generations in Seattle is actually kind of unusual. 
Um, uh, I, I did study theatrical lighting design um, and have left Seattle and have come back to Seattle. Um, but uh, I think that when it comes to uh, setting up a practice, I, I definitely took my time before deciding I wanted to actually host my own lighting design practice. So I've got about probably 23 years of experience now and I only started my own practice about six years ago. And what were your steps to starting your own practice and what were the thoughts behind it? Did you work for big uh, production companies and things before and there was something there that maybe wasn't aligned with your um, your ideas? Is that why you started your practice or mm -hmm. was it more just likely to work for yourself and push the boundaries in your own, in your own way? Yeah. I did not want to work for myself, actually. Um, and it uh, has been a very uh, terrifying endeavor at times. Um, but the thing that I wanted the most was I wanted a mock-up facility. I wanted to be able to really get my hands dirty playing with lighting fixture samples. I worked for an architecture firm for 10 years where we didn't have a mock-up room. And that just drove me crazy. We didn't have yeah. a space. And so we'd always be, you know, scrambling to find a conference room. Um, but I absolutely am a believer in being able to test things out. And sometimes the types of projects that I like enjoy the most um, are ones where we get to add a bit of a special touch to them, which uh, often means that we need to try things out. And so that was really important to me. Um, yeah, I would say so. That's interesting, yeah, because we just moved studios and we've got this amazing space now to test. But it's so funny, you know, we all gravitate to the kitchen for testing. So <laughs> we've, got, we've got this amazing setup and I think it drives our boss nuts. You know, we've got all these um, sockets that are dedicated to DMX, Dali, so we can test everything in this space. And we all just go in the kitchen and turn the lights off in the kitchen just because we're too lazy to go downstairs, I think. But it's, you know, it's great to sort of talking about that physical hands-on experience because, you know, uh, using one fitting and moving it 50 mil left or right can have such a different effect. And the amount of um, people I've had to explain to, you know, you probably had this and we'll probably get into builders a little bit more. And I've been doing it since 6 a.m. this morning is signing off data sheets. And I'm like, I, I don't know what it's going to do. It's saying wide beam. What's a wide beam in comparison? Like it's not giving me any graph. I need to hold this fitting and see it. And then I will make a decision. You know, a data sheet's just telling me the color, the effect that they think I want, but it's not, you know, you cannot visibly, you, you, you can't visibly see what it's going to do off a data sheet. You can make a good call with your background and stuff but I completely agree that physical holding the light fitting and you might see it you might see it online you know when they do a promotional video for a new fitting and you'll think oh that's perfect for this and then you get it and you just go oh it's not doing anything that it promised so yeah 100% agree with you running around plugging fittings in on site and ensuring it's you know not just what you want but the client and everybody's happy then and walks away Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had a bit of a, a habit of having a stash of light fixture samples now that we're uh, working in a hybrid manner. Some days we're in the studio, sometimes we're working from home. I have a little bag of light fixture samples, which are my favorites for being able to take a look at details because it's so yeah. often that we're actually working through details with an architect over Zoom and we're like, well, how far does that light need to be away? And I'm like, let me show you. <laughs> I have my electrical cord right by my desk and I'll like hold it in front of my camera. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Yeah, it is really important. I think it just, yeah, and trying to verbalize how you want the effect sometimes is just so difficult. And you have everybody, like you say on Zoom, just standing there going, I've got no idea what you're saying. And then you just plug it in and go, this yep. is what I'm talking about. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, completely agree. So going back to your, uh, you starting your business and the pandemic and et cetera, how have you found, I mean, how long has your, uh, you've been working for yourself and how have you found uh, working in this industry during the pandemic? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I don't think a lot of lighting designers go to school thinking that they need to understand how to run a business. Yes. And that has been a, a big learning curve. Um, yeah. I felt like I had some good coaching in that regard. Uh, 
having worked for a couple firms. But the things that really surprised me was just how scary it would be. And so actually being able to rely on having other people there who can support you if you're getting really busy, um, who can help to cover some of the work if, if you need to take a time off is, is actually really important too. Being able to factor that in, I, I have to confess, I love Excel and I love spreadsheets. <laughs> so um, uh, I think that when it comes to running your own business, you need to not just think it's gonna be a, a fun marketing adventure. It actually, you have to make sure that you can process all of your bills, you can uh, deal with collections. Oh my goodness, collections. Wow. Um, it's crazy. You have to be able to make sure you have a stockpile of resources. So if you don't get paid for 90 days, 120 days, you can still pay your staff. Yes. What's, um, sorry, what's the term collections? I'm not familiar with that. Getting people to pay their bills. Oh, oh like, yes. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, and did you start your business recently? How long have you been working for yourself? Um, so I started 2017, so yep. in my sixth year. Okay. And how many people do you employ and what are their different backgrounds? Are you all a similar background, like theatre lighting, or do you have product designers? <laughs> everybody? Well, everybody come, in this job comes from different backgrounds, don't they? So. Um, so I have two people who are working more or less full-time for me. Um, both of their backgrounds do happen to be theatre. Uh, one is my sort of residential lighting specialist, and um, the other is my Revit guru. <laughs> and uh, I have another subcontractor who has a very strong architectural background, is an architect. Uh, and then I have a manager uh, who also goes by the name of Mom, and she does my books. That sounds great. Sounds like she's the boss. Yes, she is very much the boss. Uh, and um, sorry, go on. Well, it's just, I think that it's interesting because my goal was to, in five years of time, to be five or six people. And we're close to that. Um, I think the pandemic is sort of throwing a wrench in things a little bit. I, and it is interesting because I think if you look at a lot of the lighting design studios or practices that are out there, um, I'm guessing that our size, Spark Lab size, is actually probably pretty normal. Um, there are a lot of solo practitioners and then people who have slightly larger practices. It really sort of just depends on what type of uh, products, uh, projects or what your market sector is. Um, we're very diversified. We do a lot in a, a many, like many different sectors, interior and exterior and residential, commercial, super high end to stuff that needs like family housing. So um, yeah, I think it's interesting how one structures their business. And maybe I'll learn that I need to be a little more specialized to be able to um, be successful in certain areas, but it's still a learning curve. Yeah, I think, it, I, I mean, I came from in London, I worked for, um, I went, I did engineers, uh, worked on engineers, did everything. And then for five, six years, I specialized only in high-end residential. And I honestly got stuck and I thought that was, all I could do and then I moved to Melbourne and um, luckily uh, the director just was like you can do these houses you can do anything like you've got if you've got the ideas and I got thrown in the deep end with a, um, a commercial and I was a bit like I've never done this before but I can do it I can I know I can do it you know mm -hmm. I think um, you know I'm a little bit older um, so I know now you have that I can't do this but actually you can go well I've done stuff that I've said I can't do or I'm not sure how to do before and there's always resources and I think as long as you've got um, support team anyone around you um, that you can go to and ask the question or even if you've just got a gut feeling you just want that back up it's amazing if you've got that those people around you but yeah I like um I, yeah there is companies that specialize in residential commercial office fit outs etc but where I work at glowing structures we also do a bit of everything but I think as a design team that works because um we don't pigeonhole anyone so if, if one of the designers has just done three residences in a row what we try and do is then give them a commercial because we don't want to be that repeat or have a look because 
every residential is different, the clients are different, the wants are different. Um, so I worry that if somebody's just doing the same type of project, it's very easy to fall in that trap of repeating some of the design intents. It's very easy to do that. So I think the idea of do, having a large variation of projects with, you know, even within the same sector, having different budgets and different design, you know, interior designers and architects on the team just keeps your brain aflame you know so something that you did and you were like oh that was great on the last project and four months later you might propose something similar on another project and they just all stand there going no we yeah. hate that I think yeah. it's good to bring you back down to earth every now and again yeah I was taking a look at your website and uh it looks like you have a number of well colorful backdrops and and fun people who are on your team as well and a lot of really beautiful projects um, I think that one of the things that's been interesting, and I'd love to get your take on this too, is that during the pandemic, um, you know, it's been, we had, we didn't have a studio for a portion of it. We've had a studio for the last year again, but um, working from home and figuring out how to stay connected. And especially if you don't want to be siloed and working in your own little world, how do you how do you find a way to facilitate uh, educational opportunities for you know newer staff members? Um, I think that's really tricky. I've been a we've been a very much cameras on studio. Um, I think that's been helpful. I think that um, having regular check ins with everyone um, as a team, not just one on one, but as a team, like we have weekly more than one time a week we have regular times where we're just chatting about what things are what's going on and what questions anytime we've had the opportunity to like uh message each other with hey what do you think about this or i've got this specific can we just question can we just have a quick design charrette i think that it's been it's been actually kind of cool because um yeah it is different when you're in person in a studio environment but virtually it's almost like it's more focused like mm. when you're in a studio environment, um, oh gosh, you know, my feet are soggy because I had to walk here and <laughs> like talk about things that aren't, I mean, it's just more focused. So, I mean, maybe there's some inefficiency with working from home, but I found that there's actually a lot of efficiency too. So that was surprising as a, as a business owner. Yeah. So I always have this thing. I've you know, years and years ago, years, 20 odd years ago, I ran my own small business alongside work and I hated that solo working at home, even though I only did it one day a week and it was just purely a little bit of admin. It, my brain just did not focus like that. And when we first had to work from home, I remember sitting at my kitchen table just thinking, I can't do this. I don't know. And I literally had a week where I don't know what it did. You know, when you feel like you're working, but you actually don't produce any work, you're just in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. And then um, I moved upstairs into this little space I'm at now and I got my bookshelves and some plants and I got my desk set up and, um, you know, I actually now one day a week try to work from home because my whole way of working changed and I got a little bit more organized I mean myself so I'm really good at organizing everybody else but when it comes to organizing myself not so great so now usually on a Wednesday I just do all my catch up and it's worked really well but the teams thing like you're saying we did we during lockdown every morning we'd all get online as a team and you'd have to show your face whether you were dressed your hair was done or not you know and every morning we just have this catch up and you know some people are just like oh you know go and get in their coffee but it's just that whole <laughs> you know trying to normalize the mornings where everybody comes in and has a chat um, and then sometimes during the day we'd be on a, I'd be on a team meeting with a colleague and I'd just forget she was there you know we'd both be working we'd be chatting and then we'd just be working and then she'd still we'd still be on the on the team's meeting it was quite funny because every now and again she'd say something like, oh you know because I'd just gone off and done emails and things um but I think it's made me appreciate it's made me appreciate the team I, I think I've always appreciated the team I've worked with but I've also made me appreciate being able to get in front of clients um face to face and I think this goes back to not just verbalizing good things you know we can do all these beautiful concepts and you know chat about it and present it but showing somebody you know the reason why I'm specifying this $120 down light versus an $80 here you know is 
this is why you know rather than just showing pictures and writing words and yeah. you know often clients you know we we I, I i always try to remind myself that i'm not the only consultant on a job so as much as i'm pushing the lighting to be important sometimes the clients are over phased they might have had six especially in a residential they might have had six meetings that week about tiles electrics carpentry you know it's all a bit much so yeah I, I think that whole getting in front of them making sure you're aligned but yeah it was I mean it's been difficult but I think there's been some good positive things to come out of the lockdown um we moved offices during lockdown we ended up with a much better space um you know the space that my director's always been wanting so and it just became available because of um the pandemic because the shop's closing in a certain area and now we've ended up with this amazing space so um yeah there has been some good things but yeah i mean obviously we don't want to go down that route again no <laughs> <laughs> and i think i had noted um how are you finding i mean it's a big issue here in australia at the minute and i know in the uk as well just going back to the pandemic topic and then we'll move on but um shortage of components so in like drivers um leds coming from asia for example um how is, is this a problem in america or not so much absolutely it's the same problem i think that i'm a little removed from what the contractors are being quoted um so i hear about it through the design teams or rather the the contracting teams um but everything is being delayed. Doesn't mean that it's not showing up. It's just everything is being delayed. So yeah. same, I think it's yeah. the same in the States as it is elsewhere in the world. Yeah. And I've just been making everybody aware at the start of a project that the delays are out of my hands. And um, there's nothing, like, if I tell you eight weeks now, it could change tomorrow, it could change in eight weeks, like literally the day before it's supposed to be delivered. So, you know, I, and for me to re-specify, we're going to go through this whole other you know delays again with products there's no guarantee anymore so i just make that clear at the beginning of a project that they're more than likely going to be delays um i was chatting to my boss the other day i had a meeting and the client was you know quite concerned and upset about delays happening and the joiner was there and he said i can't get draw runners he actually couldn't get the things to put the drawers in so he was making old-fashioned french waxed draw runners until the draw runners appeared in about a year he was getting a year lead time but i thought how amazing that it's making people go back to maybe you know this handcrafted yeah that's interesting yeah you know what there have been a couple um fascinating things we of course have been trying to uh make people aware of the time frame that it takes to get things known as well um but there have been a couple projects actually three projects in the last month where you know we normally review submittals and the submittals that we review give us uh for those of you who might be watching who are new to lighting they tell you everything that needs to be ordered um based on what you've specified well on some of these projects and they're not necessarily residential projects they're like smaller commercial projects we've had contractors try to write up their own submittals not get them through the sales agencies. And, and I thought, why are they doing that? And, and there's been a complaint that, that now when normally when, and another question for you is when we do our specifications, we try to write out exactly what we want such that if there's any reason why one fixture isn't available and we need to swap it out with another, or there's a reason why you might want to have to substitute it, we're basically writing a performance spec. We're writing something that's very clear on exactly what we want. And I'm afraid to write catalog code numbers down because, well, A, I don't want to have a typo and I don't want them to order something that is incorrect because I've got a catalog code wrong. And I've, had contractors come back and say that I'm holding up the process because I'm not spelling it out with giving them the exact ordering code. What do you guys do in that regard? Well, this is a hot topic for me at the minute. Thanks for bringing it up. So we've actually just stopped putting catalog codes in our specs for exactly the same reason. So, you know, we're updating and then we might have gone through all the ceiling types and it might change from black to red, you know, and it's not 
you know, we don't always get that information and um, we might have to change the beam width or the color temperature or something. And it's just that time spent. But we clearly say it needs to be 2700K, it, the beam width, the power, the size of the fitting. So like you say, it is definitely a performance spec. But what we have here, and I think um, this is, I'd be quite interested in this happening. Um, so we, everything does come through what we call a wholesaler here, usually on the bigger projects. So they're the, you know, they just look after the purchasing. Um, so I think what's probably happening with you is they're just trying to cut out middle guy, save that time, save that money. But we're also getting, there's a big um, value management issue in um, Australia. So what the big builders do, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm just putting it in really layman's terms. Um, you know, we will submit our lighting package and say it's 200,000, the contractor will say, I can get that for 100,000. And then they keep giving me alternative spec sheets. And I'm just like, you know, I've got a very specific oval beam because I don't want it hitting the walls. I need it as a guiding light. It's, that's what we've talked with the client about having wayfinding through lighting. And then they send me a spec sheet that is not the right color temperature, doesn't actually fit in the recess where we're trying to put all the services as well because we've had you know 40 meetings about this um and then isn't an oval beam so it's just going to create really beautiful bums and scallops on the wall <laughs> and not do that and then they get cross with me and i've just been doing it this morning um i've spent three hours this morning looking at off spec data sheets and i'm up to on some of them the sixth review because where I've said oval, they've just put wide flood. And now they're saying they're just going to put a, lens, a, a film in it. And I was like, fine. Well, I want to see it to make sure it's performing correctly. <laughs> and then I know the film is going to dramatically reduce the lumens. <laughs> and then I need that information. And they, they're saying I'm being awkward. And yeah. this is on very large and a very important project. And it's not me holding it up. I'm just constantly being harassed into signing off specifications that yeah. are not meeting the design criteria or the, the light fitting yeah. criteria. One of the things that I learned uh, uh, many years ago is that if I can get in early on a project and I can help to tell them what I think the budget should be, mm. I will be more successful later on uh, because the value engineering process you're talking about, every single job has it, it it's constant. And they're mm -hmm. always going to want to substitute with something cheaper. But if you can get a commitment to a budget, and I have to say that my process has been dollar per square foot, which uh, has been helpful because I have kind of, I keep track of, uh, I have a stockpile of like, okay, this project, I know how much this was and the size and the general type of project, of course. And then escalation needs to happen over time. And this is just like lighting fixture equipment costs. I have no concept of installation. Well, I have concept of it, but I can't uh, hang my yeah, hat on it. Yeah. So, um, but I feel like even at the very, very preliminary pro process um, in a project uh, in the very early phases, I can make a suggestion, which I think some people might shy away from because it seems like you don't want to be telling them something you think is inaccurate. But once we have enough experience, we actually kind of know. I mean, we know mm. how much lighting costs. The real trouble is when it comes back in and it's like two and a half times the cost and you're like, wait a sec. <laughs> and then you have to make a decision about um, how you voice that uh, understanding of things. You have mm. to pick your battles and decide what your client is, um, what their priorities are. Yeah, I always um, try to get the tender prices back to review. Um, because obviously the client just looks at the end figure and not the nobody goes through the small right. print. And then often I've had, so um, I've used fittings in a commercial space that have a much better beam spread and they'll be twice the price of the downlight that was originally proposed, but they need three less because the beam spreads a lot better. But the client just sees one for one. So the crap one's $150, the one that I'm proposing is $300 but you need three less in the space, like every so far, you know, you can get away with every other one going. So, you know, the installation costs come down, but what often just gets put in front of the client is, oh, they're, they're especially buying a double the price fitting. Well, actually we're saving you a fortune on installation and less holes cut in the ceiling, the better, it's better aesthetically and, um, 
you know, providing a better lighting solution. Um, my best one was going through once where there was in-ground spike lights and the contractor went through it with a fine tooth comb because I was trying to work out where all this extra money come from. And they were charging one and a half thousand dollars per installation of spike light. And that wasn't running the conduit to it. It was installing the spike light. And at that point, I was actually going to train as an electrician because I thought I'm missing out on something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I do, I do sort of wonder at some point um, from a kind of an ethical perspective, what we do is, um, I have a friend who, who said, it's just lighting. Now, I, I don't really feel that way because I love what we do. Um, but I do think that when we talk about wanting to vouch for the most high performance product on the marketplace, Sometimes, do we really want to tell our clients that that's what they should be spending their money on? And, and at some times, yes. And sometimes that is absolutely the right thing to do. At other times, um, you have to think, okay, by telling them it's acceptable to spend, some, spend the very bottom of the barrel amount of money, you look at that from uh, the standpoint of what, what is the supply chain like? Is that a very good carbon... Uh, footprint choice as well. So we have a lot of decisions to make. Um, so it's not just lighting, but I do think that we just have to be kind of practical in our understanding as to what our clients' needs are and making sure that we're in sync with what they're asking for. We can't push for something that is better or more because, well, that's just how it should be done. Sometimes yeah. we have to be a little flexible. Yeah, I agree. I sometimes take step backs from projects and I do think, you know, or you win an award and it's like, is the client happy with it? It's no point in us getting an award if it just looks amazing. You know, usually these product projects that look amazing have won awards is because there's been millions spent on them. And I'm like, well, it would have looked amazing whether I was involved or not. So, um, but I'm always like, is the client happy? Have we gone above and beyond and the clients not only got what they want for, but have actually walked in that space and gone, this is more than what I asked for. So, you know, and I do think as designers, sometimes we can run away with ourselves, the clients, just some <laughs> a commercial for you. They're just like, I just want it lit. And we'll be like, we can do this, we can do that. And they're like, just want it lit, you know? <laughs> and I think we're just like, let's put in a feature wall. And yeah, and I think you're right. I think sometimes we have to just come back to, is it what the client wants? And is it what they ask for? You know, they probably really don't care if they're, LED is going to die after two years, you know, so what's the point in specking the high-end Italian stuff? But they probably um, also picked you as their designer because they trust your opinion and your judgment. And so <laughs> ideally, they would also be assuming that you're going to be putting forth something that's in their best interest from the get-go, which yeah. I think you do. I think that is our goal. That is our job. That is our job is to tell the contractor what should be purchased for the job that we think oh. is in accordance with what our clients want. So. Exactly, exactly. We should start a movement. <laughs> um, what is your um, is most favoured lighting tool, tool or your team's most favoured lighting tool? And is there any fittings you think you use there in America that maybe um, people in Europe, obviously I'm from the UK originally, or Australia might not be aware of? Well, I have two favorite lighting tools. Well, <laughs> Love I, it. I like to draw. I have a notebook that I use all the time. I am an avid, I have to write and I have to scribble. In fact, that's one of our sort of things that I've been trying to convince those who work with me to do is that it's really important to keep a notebook. It's really important to keep track of things and to, to draw things when you need to try to sort things out. Um, I do have to say that there's another tool that I really appreciate. I have one of those little plug-in light meters that goes into my phone and I've tested it against other uh, uh, calibrated meters and it does a good job. Also, it uh, has uh, the ability to tell you what color temperature uh, light source you're looking at. So hmm. 
I, I think those things are totally worth the money. I slip it in my pocket. I carry with me everywhere I go. I've also been a designer. I've carried a light meter around with me everywhere I go since I was 21 years old. So like, I, it's, that's what you do. But um, I think that that tool, even though we understand how, uh, how uh, the foot candle or Lux doesn't necessarily um, tell the whole story, I feel like having that as a tool is a really useful thing on a regular basis. It's just come in so handy. Yeah. And I think also, even though you've got a lot of experience, it's sometimes good just to put it there. Okay. All right. And it's that visual thing. So I always really take a mental note of a job, say I'm trying to meet 350 looks for whatever reason, but it's very different space from the last place I did 350 looks. So it's always going to look different. So I always try and you know, make a mental note of this and maybe, oh, this job actually had all black reflective walls. So, you know, I get my light meter out, check it, it's mm. still 350. This is what it looks like with black. So then the next job I go on and I'm just trying to, yes. And uh, yeah, me is a light meter and probably a tape measure. Yeah. Because I'm oh, yeah. Taking people in the office. I just want it that far away. What's this? That far. <laughs> yeah. Um, you asked about... Uh lighting fixtures or fittings. Yes. And um, of course, it is hard to know what I don't know about um, not being in other parts of the world necessarily right now. However, I did get to go to Estonia this last fall. Um, I was a workshop head for a lighting festival there. Uh, terrific. I highly recommend the, the lighting festival in Tartu. Um, but one of the things that I think I observed um was just glare control i just think in the us we just have a better general understanding as to you install light fixtures that have better glare control so i mean generally speaking i wouldn't say that that's a um any sort of design trend difference i think it used to be um but um i i do wonder what, what more we can do there. For example, um, most of us, uh, some of us remember the AR-111 lamp and like how amazing that was because of the fact I, you, <laughs> and LED wise, like I remember Cree came out with this version of their LED AR-111 and then yeah. those sorts of things went away and now we use lenses and optics for to advantage. But I do kind of wonder if maybe there's some opportunity to look at reflection. Another thing um, we've been studying a lot lately, sorry to go on a tangent. Um, we've been looking a lot at the amount that light is reduced when it goes through prismatic material. Uh, we're working on an art project right now where we're noticing that reflected light is so much more efficient than uh, refracted light. So mm. I do sort of wonder if we ought to be asking manufacturers to be analyzing reflector technology still, because maybe it's a bit of a cop out to just put a little cap on the top of it. I mean, there might be yeah. some additional efficiencies to be gained. I think you're right. I think what's happened is the big transition from LED, from uh, incandescent to LED, is the lights still sort of stayed the same and they've, they've tried to just repeat the light output from the source. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work from like an AR triple eleven that upline. It's got, you know getting that beautiful narrow beam. I miss that so much. Um, but it's quite funny because I had a job actually going back to the AR triple one where I specified. I can't remember what brand it was, but it's something I hadn't thought about the weight of the LED. So before they were so light, you know they were just made of aluminium and they were just so light and flimsy. The AR triple ones and it popped in. I put the LEDs in and it just couldn't hold them. And they were just, yeah, dropping out. And it was on a, um, a high-end uh, restaurant in a double height space. And I just had to say to the client, we actually, you just need to buy a ton of AL triple ones till something appropriate comes out because, you know, we can't have these light fittings dropping on customers' head. Plus they weren't dimming or, you know, didn't produce a nice narrow beam, et cetera. Oh, okay. So unless you want to check the ceiling. Yeah. Uh, one more gripe. And I just want to say this publicly we have got to find a way to get retrofit lamps to dim better yes oh, yes so crazy I, I 
we, we worked on this cathedral where they really just wanted to put in some new LED A19s or A21s. Mm -hmm. And we, we went through all this effort of getting lifts in to replace things with ones that we thought dimmed well. They didn't want to yeah. spend the enormous amount of money it would cost to change their dimming system. Um, they had a really nice dimming system. It's just that it wasn't optimized for, um, uh, they didn't have phase adaptive dimmers already. So they were just kind of spending a lot of money. And we just had so many issues with getting retrofit lamps to be able to dim well. And I know that that is a very tricky thing, but if we think about the residential marketplace, um, it would be so convenient to be able to yeah. pop out with a screw-in lamp and- Yeah, and the amount of decorative that is still designed around having a, an, a, you know, a screw or a, a BC base, like is still designed around those. And, you know, some of these decorative items can cost, you know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars they're not cheap and then you put it in your beautiful commercial residential and try and dim it and then it's all a bit yeah fighting i think you're right it's crazy that um and i i i'm just going to say there's one big control systems this blows my mind it begins with p um control systems manufacture that also manufacture globes but they don't guarantee they work together so i'm just I think they should start because they manufacture both globes and control systems. Surely they're the ones to fix this issue. Mm, there are some manufacturers in the States that are really pushing hard on what they call luminaire level lighting controls um, or light fixtures that have all of the integrated controls within them that will allow occupancy sensing and daylight harvesting. Um, and they want you to have their fixtures with their controls. And uh, honestly, I just, uh, I've been reluctant to um, take on many products like that, um, in part because I, I think a lot of the lighting that I do tends to want to be invisible and doesn't have a location for a sensor. Um, but I, I do have struggle with the idea that you have to be manufacturer specific in compatibility. I want there to, I mean, do you remember when we were trying to figure out if, if LED should be Zaga compliant or if, if we needed to um, find uh, some standards in the marketplace that could then be put to uh, whether it was sockets or other types of things relative to heat sinks. Um, I, just, I just wonder if maybe we want to try to look a little more specifically about dimming technology in particular. And I know it's very complicated, so uh, this is not a simple thing, um, but I can't wait to see what the future holds. No, definitely. I, I've been looking to do the transition from uh, old school technology to new technology too. And I think it's a big learning curve and it always makes you think differently. What do you think, David? Is there going to, is, do we have any hope? Is there hope of change? Yes. <laughs> funny, funny you should say that, which is why I chimed in <clears throat> on the um, International Day of Light, which is next Monday. We are having a presentation on that very topic of oh, yes, where lighting controls are at the moment uh, and where they're likely to be in five years. Um, one of the things that I've discussed with Faye before is dimming LED lamps, they lose a lot of their red and the room feels cold. It may be great at full, 3000K, when you dim it down to about 2%, it loses its color. Yeah. The We've gray. had good success with those warm, dim retrofit lamps. Yes. They've been okay. dimmed better, and then they honestly have, since they have two different color temperature LEDs within them, they actually have better color quality for when it dims down. But I, even still, it's it's a yeah. challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah, I was chatting to David about a project I had where it just dimmed. And it just went gray and you know they you get the tech guys in they're telling me it's not a thing i'm like you can see it people are sitting at these tables looking you know half dead it just has that color shift towards the end and then david did some experimentation and tested that the red goes and i just think it's something that's not necessarily picked up on most um dog sheets or testing equipment yep um, i've got a couple of questions that have come in whilst you've been chatting one of them is, and I 
in sense, were directed at both of you. Uh, what is the most, what part of the projects give you the most satisfaction? You go, CJ. Tick, tick, tick. Um, well, every step along the way has its own subtle rewards, even the hard press before deliverable. Um, mostly because of the ecstasy of relief of it being over. But uh, I, I do enjoy, I enjoy focusing lights and setting light level scenes a lot at the end of a job. Um, and I, <laughs> and I love the, br the brilliant design conversations from the beginning. So I, <laughs> that's, I love everything. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think probably very similar to CJ, like the beginning is always exciting when you start the project. But I know it's awful and it's like when you say that relief, but when a problem comes up and you're just for the first instant is how we're going to fix this, you know, so they didn't, a detail wasn't built and you were never told, but the client still wants the same effect. And for a split second, you're thrown, but then you resolve it, you know, it's painful, you're in tears, you just, but you push through it and you come up with some idea. And I think the, getting pushed to resolve problems is always, um, I'm not saying I want problems, but I, it, it's sort of almost like an adrenaline rush once it's been resolved. Cool. Um, another question coming in from Anne Trung, is VM, value management, a process that should be legislated? If so, how should it be legislated? Or if it's a case of communication and relationship between the lighting de designers, the and the contractors, how do you negotiate uh, that process so you get a fair outcome? CJ? Um, well, I am a little more on the less legislation is more front, but maybe that's a more American perspective. Um, yeah, I don't know that I would, I don't have much to say about it being uh, something that any governmental entity would want to get into. Uh, maybe the word legislation is not quite perfect for this, unless I'm misunderstanding the application. Yeah. I think uh, the, the second bit of the question is, how do you get a good relationship with the people on site of the contractor who are looking for less money and you are adamant that the product you've specified is exactly what the project needs. Yeah. Well, How do you so negotiate sorry. that process. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, there's a trend in design uh, in my, the area where I'm working where most projects are design build uh, instead of design bid build or GCCM. So there are different delivery processes and I would say that the fact that the contractor is often at the table early on in the design process is really helpful. I love working side by side with the contractor early on because then we can talk about what's important uh, of what we're specking early, get it priced early too, um, and avoid those pitfalls later. Excellent. Um, another question. You mentioned about a phone plug-in light meter. Um, lots of people want to know what it is. Yeah, so I have a Lumu, something... Lumu meter, L-U-M-U. -U. Um, I've had it for a number of years now. There are probably are other ones in the marketplace. In fact, uh, my, my colleagues at Spark Club were plan planning to investigate at Light Fair this year and see if there are any others out there. Um, but that's the one I have. Cool. That, what is it that makes you want to get up in the morning and come to work? You want to answer that, Faye? <laughs> <laughs> Coffee. Coffee and cake. No, yeah. joking. Um, I just think in this industry, you know, um, I think we're all very lucky. I think we've found jobs when you're a lighting designer or involved in the lighting industry. People, you, It's your passion point. You're not just going just to get a check at the end of the week. You know, that's not why people do this. Um, and I think probably, I probably speak for most people that I just feel very lucky to have found an industry that, you know, is so community focused and we're all on the same wavelength and we love chatting about our chosen subject and that, it, you know, every day is different. I think that's, 
you know, and just the people as well involved yeah. day to day, I think, with me. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'll now call on Nathaniel to uh, thank you all. Thank you for your question and answers and thank the audience for their questions and joining this design versus designer session. Nathaniel. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, David, for uh, starting that out and CJ and Faye. Um, really good hearing you guys talk about things that we all care about and hopefully learning some new things as well. Um, so uh, again, be sure to join for the rest of you who are listening. Uh, be sure to join us again for the next Designer by Designer on the 26th of May, uh, when CJ will be interviewing uh, Shayat Chernantwat, CLD Associate, ILD. That should be very good, very interesting. Love to see you guys there. Uh, registration to join that on Zoom will open soon. Always join via Facebook Live. Uh, all of these uh, Designer by Designers can be rewatched um, on the IALD's video content on their YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe. Um, thank you again so much for our sponsors who helped put this on today, for CJ and Faye, um, everyone else at ILD um, put this together. Really appreciate it. Thank you to the audience for watching and putting in your questions. So stay tuned and see you next time.